All right. Good morning once again. And uh, today is a Friday. I know everybody looks to Friday, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. So first of all, welcome and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule on behalf of Verminators Management. Mr. Gavin is here. He's our CEO. And uh, Mr. Sanjay, uh, unfortunately, he can't make it because he has to be overseas. He is our chairman. Okay. And I have uh, Brian. Brian, can you just wave around? Yeah. Okay. Brian is our assistant director from Verminator. Okay. You know, a lot of times when we come for seminars, and then by the time you go back to your organization, you turn around and uh, you ask your friend, Hey, who was that guy sitting next to me? And for four hours, you are sitting there and you do not know what's the guy's name or the lady's name. So, please turn around to your partner next door. Wish him or her good morning and also introduce yourself. And if you are still wondering who's this tall, dark, handsome guy here, my name is Daniel. <laughs> okay, uh, just some quick formalities before we kickstart, yeah? First of all, I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank the different organizations who have come here representing your organizations. Just to read the names, yeah. CNW Services, we have uh, Do DoDit, Sentosa Development Corp, SICC, Singapore Island Country Club, Focal Focus Fumigation, Gurkha Contingent, okay, Esplanade, Certis. Laguna City, so sorry, Laguna Country Club, Singapore American School, Birth, Gallo Private Limited, Tractors Singapore, Alexandra Hospital, and last but not least, Shopee. Shopee, Shopee, yeah, Shopee. Okay. Um, also like to thank um, Tuan Aziz. Tuan Aziz is uh, from Focus. Uh, I'd like to thank NCL Asia, Mr. Andrew Lim, who's, who's present here. Professor Mohan and his team from SUTD. Thank you, Professor. And all our Zoom attendees who have taken time out of their busy schedule. Yes, they were not, uh, they were not, uh, not say not allowed. They were very busy in their schedule, not to say that we are not busy, okay? But for some reason or so, some of them are on stay home and some of them are for whatever reasons, they were not able to make it. So this is also being chat uh, at live. All right. So to all our Zoom attendees, thank you very much for joining us. And we hope that you will enjoy and learn uh, a lot of things from this seminar on mosquitoes and dengue. So without further ado, our first speaker for today it's uh, our head entomologist, Rachel. Uh, she will be touching on biology of mosquitoes. So can we put our hands together and give her a round of applause. Thank you, Rachel. Hello? Hello? First of all, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rachel, the head entomologist of Ominator. So today I'm going to talk about the biology of mosquitoes. So as the head entomologist of uh, Ominator, I lead the entomological R&D team in Ominator, and these are all the entomologists in Ominator. So um, I guess a lot of people do not understand what is entomologist. So perhaps this is a good chance for me to explain to you what is entomologist. So as uh, entomologists, we are experts that specialize in the study of insects. So as the entomologists that work in Verminator in a pest control company, I applied my learned knowledge in, uh, in insects, specifically in pests, in this pest control sector, and to better get rid of the pest problems. Other than that, we also get, give advice to customers and uh, provide provide uh, professional advice and then um, provide education and tra training to clients and stakeholders such as you sitting down here. And we also uh, do entomological reports for our clients also. So first, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, general biology, life cycle, common species, uh, behavior and medical importance of mosquitoes. So first of all, 
what is and mosquitoes and so obviously they the mosquitoes are small flying insects and in fact there are over 3500 species distributed all over the world except for antarctica so out of so many mosquito species actually only a few mosquitoes species they only uh, they, they transmit mosquito diseases mosquito borne diseases so talking about the deadliest animals in the world we tend to think of those uh, venomous and fierce animals such as snakes, tigers, shark, all that. But in fact, mosquitoes is the deadliest animals in the world. Why? Because they cause over 700,000 of deaths each year because the, of the fact that they transmit the mosquito-borne diseases. So uh, how do a mosquito look like? Okay, so they are small in size. So as uh, because mosquitoes are also insects, so insects, their body consisted of uh, three body parts, that is head, thorax, and abdomen. So the first thing we talk, I'm going to talk about is the mouth part. They have a needle-like mouth part, which we call it as proboscis. So like when the females want to take blood meal, they will use their proboscis to pierce through the skin. So other than that, Next one will be the antenna. So mosquito have a pair of antenna on their head. So this thing is like a needle, uh, long feather-like organ, which they use to detect the carbon dioxide and the uh, air movement. So it helps them to search for host. So other than that, we also use the antenna to differentiate between male and female. So as you can see from this photo, a male have a bushier and a ha more hairier uh, antenna as compared with the female. Other than that, the body size of a female is much more bigger than the male. So this is how we differentiate the gender of mosquitoes. So next, uh, mosquitoes also have a pair of wings. Unlike some other wing insect that have two pairs of wings, mosquitoes only have one pair. So their wings are covered with scales. So why they only have one wings, one pair of wings? So where is the other pair? So the other pair of wings actually modify into a, a club, small club-like organ, which he call it as halter. So they use this uh, to balance themselves during their flight. Okay, talking about in terms of life cycle, mosquitoes they undergo complete metamorphosis, which consists of four stages: eggs, larva, pupa, and adult stage. So the whole life cycle takes about seven to ten days. And then the adults can survive for around two to three weeks, depends on the environmental conditions. So these are the common mosquito types available in Singapore, which are medically important. So Aedes, Culex, and Anopheles mosquitoes. So first I'm going to talk about Aedes mosquito. So Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, they are the common Aedes species in Singapore. So Aedes aegypti, we also known as yellow fever mosquito because they transmit yellow fever. They are the primary vector. Other than that, they are also the primary vector for dengue. So for Al Aedes albopictus, they are also known as Asian tiger mosquitoes because of the fact that they have black and white marking on their body. So they are also the secondary vector for dengue as well. So how, how we differentiate between these two species? by looking at the uh, pattern on their thorax. So as you can see, Aedes aegypti, they have a lion shape marking on their thorax. Uh, for Aedes albopictus, they have a long white stripe on their thorax. So uh, for Aedes eggs, they are dark in color and is in a spindle shape. So as you can see from these pictures, the, the eggs is actually looks like a uh, rice grain, but it is much more smaller than that. It's like around one millimeter in size. So when the females lay eggs, the eggs are laid singly on wet surface above water level. So uh, during the, their lifetime, they can lay around five batches of eggs, and each time they can lay around 100 to 200 eggs, depending on the conditions. So... This is uh, quite interesting. Uh, a water with a volume of 20 cents coin, actually enough for them to breathe in. So we always advise like, uh, people to remove 
to check and remove all the potential water receptacles because this, this can like make them breed there. Other than that, they are, they are, these eggs are able to survive in dry conditions for up to 12 months. So during this period of time, these 12 months, whenever they contact with water, they are filled with water, the larvae will hatch from the eggs. So we always advise people to scrub the inner, inner layer of the container when you found breeding to remove all the eggs, the Aedes eggs. So after two to three days, the Aedes larva will hatch from the eggs. So the larvae is al also known as wigglers because the way they move in a wiggling motion. And they are very active. As they stay in aquatic environments. They are very active in the water. So they are elongated and cylindrical in body shape. And they have four instars. So across the instars, they will slowly get larger, they grow big in the size. So during the first instar, is it is actually very small. It's like a small dot. So as they grow larger, go to the fourth instar, they can get to 10 millimeter in size. Okay. Um, as you can see from this picture, they use this organ, which we call it as siphon, to breathe. So they go near to the water surface and then they take oxygen. Then uh, they also use the mouth brushes near the head here to feed. So they are organic uh, feeders, so they feed on organic matters in the water. So when they're resting on the water surface, near the water surface, they rest at an angle to the surface. Okay, after four to five days being an, uh, a larvae, a larva, so they will turn into an Aedes pupa. So they, the pupa also known as tumblers because uh, the way they move also, they move in tumbling manner. And as compared with some other pupa from uh, in other insects, the pupa of mosquitoes are very active. Okay, they are in common shape and they also live in aquatic environments similar to the uh, mosquito larvae and they do not eat during this stage. So most of the time, they tend to float near to the water surface, and they use the, this organ, we, the breathing tubes here, which we call it as trumpet, to breathe, to take oxygen. And uh, similar with the larvae, pupa are also very sensitive to uh, light changes. So when they sense the, some changes in light intensity, they will swim away, go to the bottom of water, the, the bottom, and then to the water wa bottom, and then they will uh, to, to avoid being eaten by the predators. So after one to two days, uh, when the times come, the case, the pupa case will split open, and then the adults will squeeze themselves out of the pupa case. So they will first they will rest on the water surface to wait for their body to hard get hardened and then dry off. After that, then they fly away. So uh, Aedes adults, they have a black and white pattern on their body. This is uh, quite obvious from the photo. And both male and female, they consume nectar and plant sap. But only female feed on blood. So this is very important. Only female take blood snail. Okay, so uh, the adult, their flight range is around 50 to 250 meter, depends on the species. And uh, they are normally do not fly long distance, it's like within the few blocks. So like normally when you see Aedes mosquito, it means that nearby you there's mosquito breeding and you have to do something. So um, in terms of the uh, oviposition behavior, what is oviposition? Oviposition is a process of uh, ov ovipositing or laying eggs. So when the female lay eggs, they prefer to lay eggs on the uh, clean and stagnant water and as well as the natural and artificial containers. They are container breeders. So they, they also exhibit one uh, behavior which we call it as skip oviposition behavior. They prefer to lay eggs in multiple locations rather than one. So there are some types of mosquito traps available in the market. They leverage this kind of behavior to control them. Next, I'm going to talk about blood feeding behavior. So as I mentioned earlier, only female mosquito take blood. So why only mosqui female mosquito take blood? Because they need the protein in our blood to produce eggs. 
So the, other than that, they are uh, day biter. They only active during dawn and dusk, and they bite during daytime normally. And although they bite people and vertebrate animals, but they prefer human. So next for host seeking behavior, they rely on olfactory cues such as carbon dioxide and uh, body odor to look for host. So uh, there are some uh, mosquito traps. They use carbon dioxide, lactic acid from sweat, and as well as the uh, ammonia from urine to serve as a mosquito attractant to trap the mosquitoes. Other than that, they are also attracted to heat and moisture, but this one, they can only detect when they get close to the, to the host. So eh, these mosquitoes, they rest on the surface with their body more or less parallel to the surface. And they prefer to rest on those dark color surface and vertical surface as well. So normally they prefer those cold, dark and humid areas. So in terms of medical importance, uh, Aedes mosquito, they transmit dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. So, like, we ca I think we all of us know now the dengue situation in uh, Singapore is quite serious. And then we, as the NEA contractor, we work hand-in-hand -hand together with NEA to fight uh, against mo dengue and control the mosquito species. So, dengue is endemic in Singapore. However, for Zika and chikungunya, uh, they are no longer endemic in Singapore. And they, uh, years ago, they, we have uh, outbreaks in Singapore. So uh, just now I talked about Aedes mosquito. Now I'm going to move on to Culex and Anopheles mosquitoes. So in terms of physical appearance, so the eggs for Aedes, as I mentioned earlier, the eggs are laid singly on uh, above water level on the wet surface. But for Culex, the eggs are in raft form, so they float on the water surfaces. So for Anopheles, their eggs are also laid singly on the water, and the eggs, they have float. So the, the, the eggs are able to float on the water surface. So for, uh, in terms of lava, for Aedes and Culex, the, the lava rests at an angle to the water surface. But for Anopheles, they are both, they are the lava rest parallel to the water surface. Because they do not have the organ to breathe, the, the siphon, just now I mentioned the siphon to breathe. So they use the spiracles on their body, which are small holes on their body to breathe. So for resting position, the adult, Aedes and Culex, they rest more or less parallel to the surface. But for Anopheles, they rest at an angle to the, to the surface. So in terms of biting habits, Aedes are day biter, they active during the daytime, dawn and dusk. But for Culex and Anopheles, they are day biter. They active at night. So breeding habitats. For Aedes mosquito, as I mentioned earlier just now, they prefer to lay eggs in clean, stagnant water. For example, those domestic containers, discarded receptacles, and uh, potted plant, hardened soil, and plant axils. However, for Culex mosquitoes, they prefer dirty, polluted, stagnant water such as block drains, puddles, ditches, all that. For Anopheles mosquito, they prefer to lay eggs in brackish water. Brackish water, they are less saline than seawater, but they are more saline than fresh water. So they are between seawater and fresh water. So yeah, for example, mangrove swamps, coastal areas, sea pages. So in terms of medical importance, um, Culex mosquito, they transmit Japanese, ence Japanese encephalitis. But uh, this one also not endemic in Singapore, but they previously endemic here. And now vaccine is available for this uh, disease. For Anopheles mosquito, they are the vector for malaria. So yeah, Singapore has been declared malaria free by WHO since 1982. So yeah, so I want to say is the Zika, Chikungunya, and malaria, Japanese sensibilities, although these diseases are not endemic in Singapore, but I think we should be vigilant to control the mosquito population to avoid the local outbreaks in Singapore in the event the disease is introduced. So that's all. Thank you. Let's give Rachel a round of applause. Thank you so much. I also realised that I didn't hear any uh, phones ringing, so I'm glad that you have turned 
off your phones or you know put it to the silent mode. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is no ordinary person. He's in fact our guest speaker and uh, a very special person to Verminator. He's our guest speaker. His name is Mr. Rama Chandra Mogan. Okay, he hails from a very important government agency. So whatever he is going to share later with us has a lot of oomph. Yeah. So if you need to take some notes for your own, uh, uh, you know, something that you can think of over the weekend, okay, and digest it, please do so. Okay, because it's very very difficult to get his appointment, and we are so blessed today that he's here with us. So a round of applause for Mr. Rama, please. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the very generous introduction. Uh, my name is Rama. Uh, I will spend the next half an hour to take you all through what is dengue. It's not an easy subject matter. If it had been easy, Singapore would have got rid of dengue long ago. Well, the nation has been grappling with COVID for the past two years. Lurking behind COVID is the resurgence of dengue. Now that we have learned to live with COVID, and COVID may not be um, in the limelight anymore, dengue will definitely uh, be highlighted in the coming uh, weeks. Now, having said that, why is Singapore endemic for dengue? The answers are in the presentation. Okay, as we go along, you will know why this small red dot is endemic. And a couple of years ago, um, and even now, our incident rates are perhaps one of the highest in the world. Okay, later on, when we go through the case stats, you will you will see why. Well, what is dengue then? Well, okay, before we go into dengue, uh, what I hope to achieve in the next half an hour is actually to give you a better understanding of what dengue uh, is all about. Okay, what is dengue fever? What are the common breeding habitats? And learn the various control methods. Now, before I go into dengue, uh, I'll just like to share what uh, I've done um, vector control work for more than 20 years. In the 20 years, what I found is this. Dengue is, yes, it's a biological thing. Uh, the mosquitoes have been around for a long time. Uh, they have been here since the Cretaceous period, which is 120 million years ago. Homo sapiens, you and I, have been here for the last three million years. So we are new to planet Earth. They are not. So they have evolved, and they are a perfect mechanism to spread disease. So it's a biological thing. However, in my opinion, dengue is a man-made problem. Okay, it's a man-made problem. And not just here, it's throughout the world. Why do I say that? Uh, we are responsible for the various breeding habitats. We're responsible for uh, how it is being transmitted from country to country. So it's a man-made problem. Again, as you go along, you will understand what I'm trying to say. So let's move along and see what is this dengue all about. Okay, there have been many, many um, press release, publicity. I'm sure all of you here are aware of dengue. It's not that you are here, you don't know anything about dengue, you are aware. I'm just going to tell you a bit more than what you already know. So enough publicity, enough of alerts, enough of uh, press release. As I travel every evening, I, I send people out for uh, swimming and tuition classes. And then I turn on to uh, the radio and then they give an update on the number of cases in Singapore every evening. So last evening, I still remember the number 74, okay, which is low. Why is it low? Yeah, that comes the first clue to as to why we are so endemic for dengue. Do we have seasons in Singapore? No. Okay, we don't have seasons. However, what are our hotter months? The June, July, August. So from now on, dengue will come down. Or it's supposed to come down. Why? Because the hotter months are over. So, the mosquitoes 
which are responsible for the spread of dengue, thrive on hot, humid climate. And Singapore is a perfect environment for them to propagate. Okay, the hot, humid. Today is hot, tomorrow is raining, cold, hot, cold. This is the cycle that they prefer. So Singapore is an ideal area for the mosquitoes to propagate. So it's a very complicated uh, virus. Uh, over 100 million infections. Uh, there are four stereotypes, dengue 1, 2, 3, 4. If you had dengue once in your life, that doesn't mean you got immunity. Okay, You need to have four infections in your lifetime and live to tell the tale. Most of our death cases are because of the second infection. See, unlike COVID, I will draw some parallels with COVID and uh, because COVID is something that all of us are very familiar with. Unlike COVID, if you had COVID once, you are not likely to get it again. I mean, the same variant. If you're Omicron, yeah, you are not likely to get Omicron again. But dengue is different. If you had dengue once, the second time you get, you will get worse. You will get worse. You will bleed. Okay, Organ failures. Okay, Internal bleeding. So that's the complication with dengue and why dengue is such a serious public health issue. Okay, and the virus itself. Uh, it's a very complicated virus. How complicated is it? I'll draw parallels with AIDS virus. AIDS has been around for what? Last 30, 40 years. Is there a vaccine? Is there a vaccine? There is some, but it's not very effective. Don't say millions. Billions have been spent on AIDS research. And till today, there's no effective vaccine. Same. It's just as complicated. Although there are countries that have come up with vaccine, they are not effective. Okay, there's no one vaccine for the four stereotype. You can read about it in other countries. Uh, well, they have gone through um, their horror stories, so to speak, on those countries that have used vaccine. So there's no cross immunity. And then uh, in Singapore, we are very unique. From a four-month-old to an 80-year-old get dengue. But if you look at the region, Thailand, Cambodia, anyone above 25 will not get dengue anymore. So that gives you the second reason why we have dengue is endemic here. Exposure. See, this is the paradox that we face here in Singapore. The cleaner you keep the country, the lower the immunity level. That is the product. So that does mean we turn Singapore into Jakarta overnight? No. You can't go back. So the, the cleaner you keep the environment, the more you do, the lower the immunity level. So that is the problem that we have. We have very low immunity. Okay, That's the second reason why we are endemic. So survey cases, yeah, you go into dengue shock syndrome, no drugs, no effective vaccine, like what I said. More than one third of the world's population is at risk of getting dengue, the, the tropical region. Okay, uh, symptom lasts for two to seven days. Okay, what are the symptoms? Later, I'll tell you. Uh, infected with the dengue virus can transmit, or you can be viramic. Okay, it spreads from person to person. Okay, it's not a. Uh, uh, act of God or anything. It is the mosquito that spreads. It bites an infected person and it spreads to another person. Okay, You can't get uh, dengue by touching uh, any surfaces or whatsoever. It is the mosquito that spreads. So these are some of the signs and symptoms of uh, uh, dengue, which is a viral infection. If you look at chikungunya zika, very similar uh, signs and symptoms. Okay, who doesn't get high fever? Even COVID got high fever. It's virus. So what makes dengue a bit different from the rest? Okay, there's one something very unique about dengue. Of course, you get rashes. Chikungunya, Zika, you also get some rashes. Okay, you turn red. How red you turn? Um, believe you me, if I've got dengue, and I turn red, you can tell. Someone with fair complexion, they will turn tomato color. Has anyone had dengue here before? Nobody here had dengue? Ah, so how was it? How was the experience? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you hospitalized? Uh, you were lucky. You were lucky. I've got friends. I, I mean, I go and interview dengue patients. Uh, I talk to them. Uh, I had some friends. It's a near-death experience for some of them. It's a near-death experience. So it's a serious public health issue. So what is unique about dengue is that you'll get this pain behind your eyeball. Okay, It's a very unique headache. You'll never get this headache, let's say you quarrel with your boyfriend, <laughs> your husband or your wife or whatever. Okay, You'll never get this headache when you go and press your ATM and there's no cash left. No, 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 no. This is a very different headache. Okay, You'll only get it when you get dengue because the retina, the capillaries behind your retina burst. They start to burst and you get this unique headache. Okay, That's dengue. Okay, look at the cases. Um, it's like a roller coaster. You will get a high, you'll go down, then you get higher, then you go down, then it gets higher and higher and higher. Two years ago, we were not, or rather, dengue didn't take the um, headlines. Why? Because there was COVID, but we had a record number of cases. 34,000. What is 34,000? It's a number. Now, how, what is that number? If you look at it, yeah, Malaysia will probably have about 60,000 cases. They are higher than Singapore. What? But what is your population? 25 million. So what is our population? Six. So who's got the highest incident rate? Singapore. As to per 100 population. So our cases are high. Our incident rates are high. So yes, it went down tremendously last year, and then this year it's up again. Will it reach last year's level? I don't think so. But next few years, nobody knows. It will go down. If let's say this year it hits about 28 or even close to 30, next year it will go down. 24, 25? Ah, nobody knows. But that's the cycle. Okay, high, low, high, low. It's a roller coaster ride. Okay, this is the next reason why dengue is such um, prevalence or endemic in Singapore. Okay, the reported cases are the top, the iceberg. Okay, 10%. The not reported cases are the 90%. What are not reported? People who are sick. No 2% comes down with dengue the same way. Given the same dosage. Okay, we are mammals. Okay? If I get, let's say, 50, uh, 50 ml of uh, dengue virus injected into me, I inject into him, maybe he will get fever for two days. I may be hospitalized for the same dosage. So no two person will react the same way. So there are people who will be sick. They will go and see doctor and say, yeah, I'm sick. Doctor will say, yeah, probably go for your blood test. Some people are very sick. They say, yeah, straight away hospitalized. So those who are hospitalized and those who have reported and they're positive are safe. Safe in a sense that can you spread in the hospital? Can you continue to spread in the hospital? No, because it's a sterile environment. I'm talking about Singapore hospital, huh? not other country hospitals where I've been. I uh, you know got mosquito, got fly, got everything, got even rats running across the uh, different, different uh, areas of the hospital. In Singapore context, yes. Once you are there, you are isolated. No mosquito is going to bite you. Those who are not hospitalized, the National Environment Agency will come and say, oh, you're, you are a dengue patient. We'll do some treatment of your house. We'll check the neighborhood. We'll check the top floor, the bottom floor, left, right, everything. To make sure that there's no secondary transmission. So you're taken care of. Now, what is this 90%? There are people who are sick but do not wish to see doctor. They believe they take Panadol, they can get cured. Okay, or what? The other cure is what I've been reading about this uh, for the last 20 years. Papaya leaves. If papaya leaves work, then if you go and see doctor, if you've got dengue, doctor will prescribe, oh, sir, you can take papaya leaves uh, two times a day. Do they prescribe that? No. So these are the people who will continue to spread. They will be in your coffee shop. They are walking around the neighborhood and all that. Then there's a third group. The third group is called 
asymptomatic, which means you do not show signs and symptoms. You're perfectly normal, but you're viremic. It's in your body. And you're sitting, what is this dengue? La? Weak, la, these people. And then it bites you, it bites the next person, it spreads. So you see, the 90% are the ones that are continuing to spread throughout the neighborhood. And they don't know they got dengue or they are in denial. So this is the iceberg theory and this is the problem that we have. So that is why it's a bit difficult uh, to contain dengue. So this is the uh, map where you get dengue across the world. Okay, you can see the South America is painted red. Southeast Asia is painted red. Tropical. Okay, they'll, say, they'll ask me, hey, why Africa only part got red? The others is desert. Desert got no water. No water, no mosquito. Simple as that. So we are right smack in the middle of a tropical region. So we are definitely endemic for dengue. So what are the common breeding habitats? Okay, it's a bit common sense. Anything that can hold water. Now this is where we will talk about why dengue is a man-made problem. Look at it. This is what? Man-made? Flower pot. Made by man. Maintained by man. Or failure to maintain leads to mosquito breedings. So it's a human issue. Okay, we are responsible for dengue. Okay, your gutters. Anything that contains water. In underneath your sink, dish rack tray, air con tray, collar of toilet bowl, unique places, okay, altar, a very sensitive part of the house, huh? Okay, I know of certain religious group that religiously will change the water every day. Then there are also people who will go on holiday for one week and then nobody changes the water. So these are areas that you look out for. You you never know when they breed. Very simple. As long as there is water, the likelihood of breeding is there. Okay, canvas sheets, uh, these are all common sense. So all these are what? Man-made. Is it natural? There's nothing natural about anything over here. It's all man-made objects maintained by men. Uh, your corridors, uh, some people turn their corridor into botanic gardens. And then that's where you get your breedings. Difficult to uh, survey and uh, look for them. Uh, bean centers, uh, your common breeding habitats, CRCs. Okay, these are hidden areas. Visible areas, we are not so worried. Why? If let's say a drain is choked, somebody will give a feedback. and say, hey, the drain is choked. Okay, they'll call hotline and what have you. you know, it's the hidden areas. How many members of public get to go inside here? No. Nobody knows what's inside. So these are hidden areas. Okay, your drains, your lightning conductor pits, uh, anything that can contain water. They're very typical breeding habitats. So Singapore is full of these habitats everywhere. Trust me, just take a walk outside you will come across many, many potential grounds. Look around your own homes. Many, many potential grounds. Your neighborhood. They're all potential breeding habitats. Okay, your, your barriers, your hardened soil, so on and so forth. Okay, now, yeah, now that we know what is the issue, now how do you control that? This is the difficult part. This is the very difficult part. Uh, so much so that control is something that a lot of people uh, think they know, but actually it's not done properly. That's the reason. Okay, that's the reason why we still have dengue, okay, few, few reasons, uh, premise owners, uh, households, facilities, uh, various organizations are not doing their due diligence. Okay, not doing their due diligence. So the control is something that you need to understand. So how do you control? Thermal fogging. Fog. 
Fuck? Fuck? Oh, you fuck? Fuck? Let me tell you about fogging. Okay, uh, let's say I have a bowl of water that's here. First generation, second generation, third generation will come out. I'll fog. I'll take my gun, I go around for brrr. I knock out the first generation. Second generation is still coming out. Fog, second generation out. Third generation is still coming out because the, the bowl is still there. Second, third, fourth, fifth generation is coming out. And every week you have to fog. What happens if I get rid of the bowl? What happens? Is there a second generation? Is there a third generation? Is there a fourth generation? Nothing. So the most effective strategy in dengue control is source reduction. Taking away the breeding habitat from the transmission equation. If I have a roof gutter, if I remove the roof gutter, no more breeding. If I have a flower pot, I remove the flower pot, no more breeding. So you need to actively look for habitats that will can be removed from the equation. But having said that, there are of course many, many habitats that can for example, if I have a drain that's choked, can I remove the drain? No, you can't. So that's where larvae siding come in. Larvae siding is a temporary measure. So that now that you're familiar with some of these terms, let's look at how you control. Environmental control, this is engineering. Okay, you engineer a structure so that it doesn't contain water. We used to have bamboo pole holders. Now that we have new houses, do not have bamboo pole holders anymore. They have been re-engineered to have these kind of racks. So that's eliminated. Engineering controls. Okay, your environmental controls. No more roof gutters in certain areas. Okay, this is what we call roof gutters that are eliminated. Your facilities may have roof gutters. Some are part of a structure which cannot be removed. But if you can remove, why not? So you've got to look at it that way. Okay, physical barrier, wire mesh into some of you cannot remove this water tank. Eh? Water tank is there. Uh, if you take away the water tank, then how? There's no drinking water or whatever. So what do you do? Engineering controls. Put wire mesh. You have gully traps. Put in the anti-mosquito valve into your gully traps. Then, of course, adult deciding. Thermal fogging. The most effective is source reduction. Take away the habitat. Of course, in outbreak situations, what causes an outbreak? What causes a dengue outbreak? What's the root cause of the problem? The Aedes mosquito is not an act of God that you get dengue. It's because of a mosquito. So mosquitoes are present. Or in a large number, if you have an outbreak, so you do fog. But it must be done correctly. Correct number of guns. Uh, you need to plan for it. Uh, very often I've seen people take one gun, go around one big school, junior college. One thermal fogger gun, one junior college. Is that sufficient? I'll give you a very good example. All of you are seated here, correct? Let's say I open that door and bring in one thermal fogger and start to fog. Where will you all run? This door, lah. correct? So what happens if I open that door, I bring one thermal fogger, this door, I bring in another thermal fogger, then where you run? Oh, there's one, okay, I put one there, one there, then where you run now? So it's called a kill zone. You create a kill zone, you come in concentric circles, so there's no escape route. Mosquitoes will run. Eh? The moment you start to fog, they'll, they'll try to run. So that's how you create a kill zone. So it's not rocket science, but nevertheless, you must know how to do a proper fogging. Not one gun, because next tomorrow got price presentation, the minister is coming, take one gun, go and 
fought the school. One gun. So when people are, oh yeah, I fought already. So one minister comes, don't worry, fogging done. So I don't know what is that going to help. And then you have indoor, indoor misting. Uh, this is very effective. What is the enemy that we are talking about over here? It is the Aedes aegypti mosquito that came from Africa 100 years ago to Singapore. It's indoor. It's inside. So if you fog the inside, it's very effective. They are within you. The enemy is within you. Okay, then we have biological control. These are natural controls that we have. Okay, you introduce fish, uh, parasites, so to speak, into uh, water bodies. Um, having said that, uh, the literature says if you have fish, you will not have any breeding. Correct? Isn't that what the literature says? I found otherwise. I found otherwise. Why? I've been to some ponds. There are fishes. And yet I found larvae. How is that possible? How is that possible? You know where I found them? Inside koi pond. Koi vegetarian lah. <laughs> Since when koi eat larvae? So you must understand, it's not a, a question of looking at the literature and then uh, blindly following. You must understand the concept in order to have effective control. So the next biological agent which I want to dwell with is actually your BTI. Okay, is what is BTI? What is the acronym for BTI? It's Bacillus thuringicus israelis. Okay, it was first isolated in Israel. Yes, it is now being produced all over the world. Um, this is a very good picture. This is someone doing BTI treatment at. Let me guess that place. I know Singapore terrain quite well. This is Lorong Halos Wetlands. If I'm not wrong. Okay, I'm first time I'm looking at this picture, but I can tell you where is it. Okay, it's Lorong Hollows Wetlands. How does BTI work? It's not a silver bullet, so to speak. If you go to N Park's area, they'll only allow you to use BTI and no other products. Why? Because these are some terms that I want to introduce you to. It's called target specific. Okay, it's called target specific. VTI only works on mosquitoes and three fly species. Only mosquitoes and three fly species. So if I have a pond, if I put chemicals inside the pond, what will happen to the pond? Yeah, everything will die. The fish will die, the frog will die. Uh, the bird come and drink the water, bird also die. Everything, the ecosystem is completely destroyed. If I use conventional chemical, what happens if I use BTI? Everything also die. No, why no? Why no? Why? It's called target specific, it only kills mosquitoes. It doesn't kill anything else. Why is it so? That's where the bacteria comes into play. The bacteria only gets triggered in alkaline medium. Our gut system is acidic. Fish is acidic. Frog is acidic. Cat, dog, everything else is acidic. So when you ingest the BTI, the toxins don't get triggered. The toxins only get triggered in the mosquito gut, which is alkaline. So that is why it is target-specific. And it doesn't affect the ecosystem. So that is BTI, in short. So we looked at our climate. We looked at how... Only 10% of the cases are reported. 90% is not uh, reported and they are continuing to spread. Now, the other two reasons which I'm afraid will kick into place is starting soon. 
The next reason why it, Singapore is so endemic for dengue is because look at the way we live. It's a congested country. Okay. The last we calculated was 9,000 people per square kilometre. That is very high. Uh, that's the average uh, across the island. But if you look at some of the housing estates, well, they are like smack next to each other. So when you have, say, COVID or dengue, it spreads very fast. It spreads very fast. It's very conducive, the way Singapore has been set up. Okay, that is another reason why we are so endemic for dengue. Now, the last reason is what I'm afraid of. We have very porous borders in the sense that uh, we are very open for tourists to come in. The last two years, we were lucky, and yet our cases were record high. Can you imagine when the borders are fully open and everyone from around the world starts visiting Singapore and bringing in their exotic uh, illness, diseases, and whatever. Every year, every day, we have about 350 to half a million uh, workers from Malaysia coming in. Through the two uh, causeways. So once the borders are fully open, I fear the worst. I fear the worst. Okay, dengue just didn't come into Singapore on its own, like chikungunya and Zika. People brought it in. People brought it in. So now that we have open borders and we are going to open it even further, well, things may get complicated. So that is why we are endemic for dengue. Now with that, I think we can end the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rama. Really appreciate the in-depth knowledge towards uh, dengue and the situation in Singapore. Okay, um, we're going to have uh, our break in a short while. The break will be just outside the foyer here. 20 minutes, and thereafter, we will proceed to a live demo. We will usher you up the escalators and all the way through the overhead bridge and down the escalators, we have got two war machines that are warring against the mosquitoes uh, in Singapore. And we are using this with some of the government agencies, especially the National Environment Agency. So we will give you a live demo. Not to worry, there are no pesticides inside. It's basically water just to show you how it works and um, why it is so special. Okay, and... Uh, for your restroom, as you go out, you turn left, there's a restroom. Okay, that's the nearest. But if you want to clock 10,000 steps, you can go out of this foyer, you turn right, and you have another restroom towards the end. Okay, with that, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you again after the live demo. Thank you. Okay, once again, we thank you for seeing our live demo. I know it's National Day period, so that one's somewhat similar to those days uh, when we used to have the floats and then we stand on the side of the road, okay? And uh, not to worry if uh, our partners and our friends who have not seen it on the Zoom, okay? I also have got video, official video presentation of our two V-Rex and v bot as well. So I'm going to do a presentation on management of mosquitoes, okay? So if you see the management of mosquitoes, there is our tagline called No Escape. Okay, so no escape means no escape lah. Huh? Exactly no escape. Okay, so we don't allow the pest to escape uh, from uh, our hands when we are actually strangling the pests. Uh. No, jokes aside. Uh, otherwise, NPARCs will come after me. Okay, so we are going to talk about the various uh, mosquitoes management strategies which Verminator adopts Okay, and some of this is not available even in this region. Like you have seen the V-Bot earlier on, the second one. It's not available in this region. It's from Europe. And we are the only company, pest management company in Singapore that has the V-Bot in Singapore and the region as well. 
I know all of you have got your sumptuous uh, tea break earlier. You may be feeling a little, you know, sleepy, but trust me, I'll be showing you a lot of videos so that you can better understand, yeah, our management strategies. So, introducing to you our V-Rex and our V-Bot technology. So, what exactly is V-Rex? Okay, it's state-of-the-art innovation combining two deadliest equipment. We call it the U40 and as well as the AF95 uh, high-performance fork generator. The U40 has a capacity you were seeing earlier on. It has got four different nozzles, you know, targeted at different areas of application. Okay, so because we have to do an initial assessment first before we shift those, no those nozzles to that area. It is not permanently fixed, yeah? It's based on the landscape and the area that we are treating together with government agencies. And it has a tank capacity of up to 75 litres and can deliver chemical substances into minute droplets. Each nozzle can be customised, as you saw earlier, to the intended direction of target. It also has the high fork, you know, generator. Uh, we could not blow the fork earlier on, otherwise it could have been very massive. It's equivalent to about 10 to 12 ordinary foggers in operation. So what does it tell you? It tells you that we are moving towards not just innovation, but being productive as well. Okay. So the unit has been designed for economical treatment of large areas and as well as spaces. Yeah. The fork can drift over the infested area very effectively. Okay, with minimal contamination. So and very important, it it must stay in the environment to knock off the mosquitoes. Many a time, sometimes you see what happens is it is so diluted, it is just like as if someone is smoking a cigarette and the fog just disappears. No effect. Okay, just like when you punch somebody, right? You make sure you need to give the fellow a good punch so that he knocks off, he knocks down, right? So in the same way, the fog has to be so dense that the mosquitoes actually are ridden off from the affected areas, yeah? So this is our video on the V-Rex, our official video. So these are the areas where we are working together with NEA in dengue prone areas huh? or dengue hotspots. So you can see from this video here the fog is very dense. Yeah? That's another operation with the National Environment Agency. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. Next, I want to introduce you, uh, not to worry about the fire alarm, I think there must be some kind of testing going on. Okay, next I want to introduce you about our another machine. It's called VBOT, Verminators Robot. It's a vehicle-mounted sprayer, the one that you saw, the second one. Okay. It is an atomizer that can be used for the purpose of disinfection as well as pest management. So it has got a two-prong uh, uh, where you or you know somebody wants to use it for yeah, and we it's meant for outdoor large scale misting or spraying because the the tips can be uh, adjusted to the mist mode or the spray mode. You will see in the video later. Okay, it is beautiful. It's a one man operation. Okay, and the driver in the cockpit of his cabin can adjust to the spray pattern and how he and which area he wants to treat. Okay, thereby improving productivity further, yeah? And it's able, it has the capacity to reach 35 to 50 meters. So even tall, tall tree niches are also targeted as well. Okay, with a tank capacity of 400 liters. It is equipped with handheld sprayer at the back of the uh, device. Uh, this is meant actually very for very target specific application or areas that are hard to reach. Okay. So it ensures that nothing escapes. La. That's why we said no escape. Yeah. So this is the video. So it has got various functions, yeah. This is the one that I was mentioning earlier for hard to reach areas or areas that needs additional attention. Okay, we also have got mosquito traps which were displayed outside here. I have actually spoken with some of you, okay, uh, how this how these traps behaves. Okay, the first one I will start with is the indoor use, the biogen, we call it the BG home, indoor use trap. It is it covers about 40 square meters. I'm so sorry, 40 meters square. It's about an estimate of about a master bedroom size. Okay. This one ha only has a lure. This one cannot be fixed to a carbon dioxide cylinder. This only has a lure. It targets Aedes mosquitoes. There's, there are no toxic pesticides. You know, like sometimes you, I don't want to mention names, okay, with no ill intent, you have those electrical plugs, right, with the chemical. So what are you doing? You're also breathing in the fumes. Or those days, you know, very traditionally, we burn mosquito repellent coils. We are also breathing in those fumes as well. But this is totally no toxic pesticides. This is uh, an outdoor trap. It covers uh, up to 20 meter radius. It's about plus minus an estimate about 40 to 50 meters of a swimming pool. Okay, does not damage any beneficial insects like butterflies or even the bees or ladybugs. Why? Because it only it's very target specific. It only targets the Aedes mosquito. So there are other, we have not displayed outside, in fact, due to the space constraint, there are other models as well. So how, how do these Biogen's mosquito traps work?
it's a. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. We have investigated the situation. There has been a false alarm. We apologize for any inconvenience caused. Thank you. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. <laughs> we have investigated the situation. There has been a false alarm. We apologize for any inconvenience caused. Can someone tell the lady we heard it loud and clear already? Yeah. So anyway, I hope that's got nothing to do with some pest that's triggering the uh, the alarm. Uh, okay. So how do this mosquito trap works? Okay. This has been designed in the University of Regensburg in Germany in a place in a town called Bavaria. Okay. I'm sure you all, you know, the guys may know uh, where the beer comes from, right? Okay. Uh, over 16 years of research. So it's not something that they have just develop, okay, you know, they put it out in the market and they start selling. No, it has been developed, it has been researched for over 16 years, okay? Its efficacy is confirmed by scientists and other experts throughout the world. So basically, what it does, it mimics a human being. So even with the CO2 cylinder, what happens? We have a regulator that regulates the discharge of the carbon dioxide, just like human beings, right? So the CO2 acts as a catalyst to further enhance the catches of mosquitoes. This is a video of how it so works. So how does the trap work? The trap imitates the manner in which odors are presented by a human body. As visualized here, odors are released slowly and move upward in a plume because of our body heat. Biogens has developed and patented an artificial human scent, the BG Sweet Scent. This scent, which is especially attractive to tiger mosquitoes, is dispersed by the trap in a plume that closely resembles that produced by a human. The BG Sweet Scent is placed into the trap and remains effective for up to two months. The design is clever and patented too. One single fan both disperses the BG sweet scent and catches the mosquitoes. Additionally, the black funnel centered in a white surrounding is visually attractive. Approaching mosquitoes are lured closer by these cues and end up in a catch bag where they dehydrate. Beneficial insects like bees or butterflies are not attracted by the trap. Okay, so it does not affect any beneficial insects. Okay. Next is the Intuke. You may have seen it outside as well. Okay, what is this Intuke mosquito trap? Okay, it has been designed, okay, and it's recommended one, at least 10 traps per acre. Okay, that's how the coverage is. So what happens? In the trap itself, yes, it'll be filled with water, okay, right below the discharge level. Okay, it has got a netting that is coated with IGR as well as bacteria. Okay. That's how they have done it. And knowing mosquitoes, they do not lay uh, their eggs all in one basket. Uh. They always say, please do not lay all your eggs in one basket. So the same goes for the mosquitoes. What she does, what, what does the female mosquito do is she will lay eggs here, she will lay eggs there. Okay. So in that process, it will create a domino effect of the bacteria in other breeding sites as well. So the exposed mosquitoes are killed due to the bacteria and it has been reported that it stops the virus development. This is through the scientists. Right? It has been reported that the virus, the, the dengue virus development is actually being stopped. So the Aedes mosquito is no longer carrying the virus in her. Okay, just now some of them were asking me, okay, does all the Aedes mosquito transmit dengue? The answer is no. All the mosquito, all the Aedes mosquitoes do not transmit dengue unless the female mosquito bites a person who is affected with the virus. Then that particular mosquito, the female mosquito, starts transmitting that virus to others. Okay, that's that's how it is. All right. So this is the video. This mosquito lays eggs in multiple tiny places of water that are hard to find or treat by pest management professionals. This makes it a real challenge to control this mosquito by conventional means. Unlike any other product available today, 
The Into Care trap uses this unique behavior to help keep your yard mosquito free. The mosquito is attracted to the trap. When the mosquito visits the trap, she gets contaminated with the active ingredients. When she flies out, she spreads the active ingredients to all breeding sites that she visits next. Also the places that are hard to find. This will effectively knock down the mosquito population in your yard. This unique and precise spot treatment reduces the amount of chemicals that would normally be sprayed in your yard. It does not harm humans, pets, or beneficial insects such as bees and butterflies. Okay, moving forward, we also want to introduce our latest innovation that is known as the mosquito misting system. It's one of the latest thing, okay, which a pest management company has introduced to the market or will be introduced in a matter of a uh, uh, few weeks, yeah? The mosquito misting system. So basically what it happens or what happens is it's pro programmable, okay? We have an app that you can program the misting when it needs to be discharged based on the species of mosquitoes that we are managing. Whether Aedes, la, whether Culex, or any other you know, species, okay? That's how we can program it. And that's exactly how the mist will be discharged, okay? This is the one that will create a true barrier system surrounding the property as well. And even if you are on a holiday, or you are not in town, or even uh, verminator staff, yes, once a month they need to come to check whether all the components are working and all that. But at the same time, they need not be there physically. They can know what is the volume of the tank, okay, whether any refill needs to be done. I'll show you in a short while. So there's an app, there's a digital app, the Mosquito Misting digital app that allows you to monitor what is the level of the solution in the tank, okay, and when it needs to be filled up again. Okay, and the best part is you can program it to the type of the mosquitoes that you are targeting. So, we have uh, talked about all the various mosquito management strategies that we have. Why Verminator is so unique? What is the uniqueness of Verminator? You know, there's about 300 over pest control companies in Singapore and always growing because everybody is opening up a pest control company. All right? So, but what is so unique about Verminator? I'm not selling Coyote now. Huh? I'm just sharing with you. Okay, first of all, we are focused. We are not diversified. When I say focus means what? We are very focused towards managing pests. We are not doing, we are not into the, you know, some other business like toilet uh, uh, and any other business. No, we don't do that. We are very focused towards just managing pests. Next, we are always, have you have seen through our various innovation, the two vehicles, V-Rex and V-Bot, and the equipment that we have outside there. Uh, we are also partnering with SUTD. Okay, you see that we are always continuously innovating. Companies who do not innovate today will suffer tomorrow. Okay, so we are continuously innovating our pest management strategies and we are very serious in our business. We have a no-nonsense approach in managing pests. Okay? Our staff are trained not just by ITE, that's uh, formal training, every pest control technician or worker must attend. We have or we conduct internal training as well and we are very strict about that. So we have on-the-job training and we have internal training to ensure that our staff are able to deliver what is being promised. Yeah? Call upon when others fail to deliver. This has happened so many times. Okay, We are called upon when others fail to deliver. So what happens? Okay, We go down, we take an assessment of the area, Okay, we recommend a program for them and that's how it is being done. Huh? Okay. We are also a company that has set standards with an outstanding track record. I met a gentleman and I asked him, how did you come to know us all through BCA? I saw your BCA grading. Okay. Or sometimes when we ask, how did you come to know us? Oh, your team came with NEA. They are very focused, very diligent the way you manage your mosquito inspection. Okay, so these are the feedbacks that we uh, regularly receive. Yeah. 
So these are some of the suite of our services that we provide. General pest management, disinfecting, entomological reports you heard from Rachel earlier on. Okay, pest management audits and trainings. This is just one of the trainings. We also conduct training for our partners. You know, you have to buy into the system. You need to understand what is pest management all about. You know, pest management, we do not have, we are not like those, you know, fairy tale uh, lady that comes with a van and ting, that's it. You know, all the pests are gone. No, we don't do that. We have to work together with you as your partners to manage pests and to get rid of pests. Okay? Last but not least, thank you. And we will come to our question and answer. So can I have Mr. Rama? I need three chairs here at the front. Mr. Rama, Rachel. So I'll be a moderator. If you have any questions, uh, I will pass you the mic so that everybody knows. Okay, the question. Yeah, Brian, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Aliza. I'm from representative from Singapore Swimming Club. Uh, I just have a question on the thermal fogging. Uh, Ms. Rama did mention about when you do a fogging, it has to be basically closed off so that the uh, mosquito itself doesn't run. But uh, I just want to know how effective it is because we do a weekly fogging in our place and we're talking about external area. In scales of 1 to one to 10, what is the percentage like? Um, hope you all can... Uh, good question. Uh, I was about to touch on that if uh, nobody asked about this fogging. Um, first and foremost, uh, how effective and all that, okay, I'll, I'll answer this question in stages. Uh, first question that I have for you is weekly fogging. Why do you have a weekly fogging? Uh, okay, maybe uh, I, I can also illustrate that through uh, an example. All of us, when we go back home, do we have bygone shield talks and all that at home? All of us keep, correct? Yes. When do you use it? Or do you like call your wife and say, hey, darling, today is Friday. I will schedule a, a spraying day and then you start spraying your house. Do any of you do that? No, right? Why don't you do that? Yeah, Because you only do that when you see an entrail, you spray. When you see a cockroach, you spray. Sometimes people see lizards, they'll spray. In my house, I'm asked to kill the lizards. So you only do it when there is a problem. You don't tell your loved one, say, darling, today is Friday, I will schedule a spring day. You take out two cans of bygone, start spraying your whole house. Isn't that a waste of time? So weekly fogging, that means your area has got serious pest problem. That's why you fog weekly. I take it that way. So there is no need to fog weekly. There's no residual effect in fogging. For example, if I were to fog this compound this morning using, say, 20, 30 guns, two days later when a mosquito, or even this afternoon itself, the mosquito fly by and said, yeah, was there fogging this morning? It only kills on impact instantaneously. Okay, when the mosquito is there, you fog, that's it, you get killed. Four or five hours later, the mosquito will fly by, it's not going to get killed. There's no residual effect in fogging. Now, how effective is fogging? That would be your next question. It is, there are a few factors to effective fogging. First of all, you must have the correct number of equipments. Okay, which means that, you know, you don't, like why I give an illustration, uh, somebody also concurred with me. Uh, yeah, we took one gun, we went round the whole compound, we fogged. Uh, the afternoon itself, we got beaten by mosquito. So one gun, you're playing 
hide and seek with the mosquito. I fork here, the mosquito fly there. I fork there, the mosquito fly back here. So you're playing catching. They are smart creatures, especially the Aedes mosquito. You must know the Aedes mosquito is the strongest mosquito among all of them. Uh, how would I say? They don't fly far. Okay, I give you a very good illustration. They are the Hussein Bolt among the mosquito. They will run 100 meters like that, and that's all. The Anopheles mosquito will fly 5 kilometers. They are weak. They are like the Kenyan long distance runner. They are weak. So, fogging for Aedes. You must have the correct number of guns, correct uh, planning, and secondly, you say, okay, for example, now I start to fog outside here. Okay, you see a lot of smoke, correct? Fogging is a visible uh, sign that a pest controller has been around. I mean, many, many years ago, the sure tail sign that you have actually engaged a pest controller is through the fogging that you see, the smoke. It's visible. Okay, it's visible. So yes, there's smoke. The smoke is actually kerosene or diesel or glycol or whatever that you have used. It's the carrier. Do you know there were any chemicals that are being used? The glycol, the kerosene, the diesel is not going to kill your mosquito. Huh? It's the chemical that's inside. Do you know that the fella has used one teaspoon or one tablespoon? You don't know. Okay, you don't know. As a facility, when you run the facility, you have every right to ask the pest controller, what are you using? Take the bottle. It must be in a sealed bottle. What is the dilution rate? It's all that is behind. Okay, you are supposed to do that. So when I was doing ops those days, I used to go to construction sites. You know, the, 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 the smoke is so thick. Over the years, I can smell ethylene. I can smell malathion. I can smell cypermetrine. I can smell a lot of chemicals. There are times when I go into the construction site and I go and sniff. I only smell kerosene, which means zero chemicals were used. So effectiveness of fogging depends on what pest are you targeting. Again, the timing is important. I've seen people do fogging at 11.30 in the afternoon, uh, morning or 2.30 in the afternoon. Why we say don't do during those times? Like I said, what species are you trying to eradicate? If it's Aedes, Aedes is effect, uh, are only active during dawn and dusk. That means they are out in the air during dawn and dusk. That means about your 6.45, 7.30, 8 o'clock, thereabout. Then the next is about 6.30, 7, thereabout. The other times they are hidden somewhere or they are hiding. So in order for fogging to be effective, it must be done at the correct time. For example, if you want to kill Culex mosquitoes, don't fog during the day. It must be at night because they're only active at night. Or even malaria mosquitoes, your anopheles. It must be done that so you must know what you are trying to achieve. Then if that your goal is to eradicate the mosquitoes in your facility, how many guns are you getting? What chemical are you using? Is it the correct dilution rate? Okay, the dilution rate may be 1 to 19. You may be using only one, one teaspoon. Do you know? You wouldn't know. Smoke is smoke. Like I see people smoking. You see one guy smoking, can you tell it's Marlboro or Salem or whatever? No, right? You only see smoke. So, how effective it is depends on how you do it. When you do it. But if you want to do it every week, not too sure why, the money can be best used for other purposes. Okay, I'll give you another example. I have a friend who stays in a condo. I stay in HDB. My friend says, hey, my condo, uh, every week got fogging. No. You're HDB. Uh, once in a while only got fogging. I every week got fogging. No. Well, that means you every week got problem. La. Your condo every week got problem. La. That's why you fog. Like what I say, when you take out your bygone, got N, you spray. If you take out a bygone, every day means every day you got ants, every day you got cockroaches, every day you got something. So, very simple illustration that I've given. So, fork when there is a need because when there's nothing there you fork, it's a waste. 
It is a total waste. Just like I said, you go back home, you don't take your bygone and start spraying for nothing. Correct? So same principle applies here. So the effectiveness, it depends on a few factors. Time, machinery, chemicals, techniques, so on and so forth. Hope I've answered your question. So I feel very safe going to your swimming pool because every week you're fogging wet. Depends. If you have a problem, it minimizes. If you don't have any problem, what are you going to minimize? Because when you fog, you remember it's chemical. Huh? You're not only killing a mosquito, huh? you're killing your butterfly, mm. your dragonfly, your whatever fly fly. And then plus, uh, people who are around there are also inhaling this thing into their system. It's a poison. That is why uh, the pest controllers have to go for blood tests every six months once to make sure that there are no markers in their blood. Likewise, I also go for blood tests six months once, which are horrible experience, but no choice because we deal with these chemicals. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Kevin. Eh? Right. Oh, he's uh, your client. So sorry, I asked you to no, stop. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. It, it's not about client or not a client. But but uh, yes, Rama is very correct in what he said. Uh, what what I think needs to be done in your case, uh, the fogging is to eliminate the adult mosquitoes if there is a <coughs> breakout. That's one. Number two, when you have adult mosquitoes biting you, flying around, that is an indication that you have lots of breeding habitats within the premises. What I would have done is, yes, I will do a fogging first to eliminate the adults and then do a maintenance. Instead of fogging, what you could actually do is you could do misting on a regular basis. Why? Because there's a residual effect left behind and if any mosquitoes do fly into your premises, and if they're going to land at those areas, they come in contact with the compound and they will die off. Okay? Number three, uh, if you are in a place like a swimming pool area, the other one is you could actually consider using BTI. We, we spoke earlier on. BTI is actually very, very effective. Here again, uh, it does not kill the adult mosquitoes. But the BTI spores are actually left into areas where there are pondings, where mosquitoes are breeding, and they get activated, and that also helps eliminate. I hope the additional answers your question. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Rama. Sorry, just to add on, I've got one formula. It's patented. Uh, there are three conditions where you will need to fall. First condition is a disease outbreak. There is an active dengue cluster or malaria cluster, whatever that is happening. There is a disease transmission. This disease that is being spread, dengue or whatever, is because of mosquito. Not someone do BOMO to you. Okay? It is because of mosquito. So if they are there for sure. If not, there will not be a transmission. Okay? So that's one condition. Second condition, you as a facility manager have gone around your uh, facility and found that there were high number of adults. Okay, as you stand there, you were beaten. You know, you wear dark pants. Uh, you're attracted to the dark pants. And then you also have uh, clients and all that. Uh, your customers are complaining. Hey, when I was sitting down at this uh, deck next to the pool, I was beaten. That means there is a doubt. Then you fall. Third condition. I found a lot of breeding habitats. Let's say the swimming pool, use the swimming pool example. Maybe on a day where we go and do a survey, we found 10 breeding habitats. The eggs did not fly from the sky and drop into the breeding habitat. It was laid by a female mosquito. That means there are female mosquitoes in the vicinity laying eggs. That is why you got all this breeding. Then you fog. Three conditions. If you don't have these three conditions, I don't understand why you need to fog. Oh, because got VVIP coming. Correct? I've heard this too many times. Oh, we have a price presentation. A uh, minister is coming, so we need to fog. And then someone with one gun. 
hope that clarifies not just your uh, query, but if others were to uh, ask anything about fogging, I hope that also answers that, that, that aspect of thermal fogging. Yes, please. I'm from uh, Tractor Singapore. My question here is, uh, we're talking about misting, right? And then there's another term you use, residual effect, residual effect. So the question is, what's the duration of the residual effect? Because we look at Singapore, we have hot season, rains and all that. So if you don't do fogging to control the doubts or whatever, I mean, ha I mean, you talk about the three conditions and all that. So uh, th th that gentleman have uh, introduced about misting. Okay, we can do that. Lah. So same question again as what the lady have asked. What is the effect? And what oh. is the duration of the residual? Residual spraying. Okay, just now my CEO, Mr. Gavin, mentioned about the residual effect of misting. Actually, misting is uh, an excellent way of managing the mosquitoes, uh, you know, population. Because like what Mr. Gavin mentioned earlier on, the fog dissipates. And like what Mr. Rama says, and if the mosquitoes are there, yes, they get, you know, and also the time of fogging and all those things. Yeah? So the misting, what it does, it creates a kind of a, like a after effect of the chemical compound onto the landscaping. Okay, so what happens if you ask how long it takes, okay, can be very subjective, but the usual answer is up to a month. Unless there's a very, very heavy downpour, it washes away. Because the misting is not onto the, the top of the leaf itself. It's also on the below portion of the leaf. So that's the reason why the application of actually doing it is very, very important rather than just going through the exercise. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, misting has got a few types. They have an adulty site, they also have a lover site. What Mr. Gavin and also just now Mr. Rama uh, also shared with y'all is this BTI. Okay, it's a bacterium that is found in the soil, discovered by the Israeli uh, scientists. Okay, and that is uh, alternative to look at when you want to look at all, uh, lava siding. Okay, and that is a safe uh, way to move forward now. Yeah, misting, there are actually two types, like what mentioned. One is the adult misting. You miss on surfaces. If you look at mosquitoes' behavior uh, after a blood meal, uh, they usually take a break. It's just like most of us, after nasi biryani, you'll take a break. Mosquitoes, the same. After a blood meal, they have to rest. But it's very effective for Anopheles mosquito. That's for sure they need to rest. The Aedes and Culex, the, the literature says, yes, they will also rest because they cannot process the blood meal on flight. So when they rest and you have coated the surface with an adulty site, then of course uh, they get knocked off. Then of course there's another type of misting is where we dispense BTI into water bodies. That means a BTI mister like what you see in this picture, uh, it will dispense the bacteria onto water bodies. So any mosquito that is breeding within these water bodies uh, when I say water bodies, we're not talking about the visible one. I mean, if it's a cup, no. Throw away the cup. Lah. But if you look at this picture here, there are areas where water bodies where it's difficult to go and do uh, a treatment. So you need to do a misting. Misting is like rain. It comes down. So that one will kill the larvae. But you should never mix these two concepts, the adult siding and larvae siding. Larvae siding is for the larvae. Adult deciding is, of course, to kill off the adult. Now, coming back to fogging, misting, um, uh, whether it's adult misting, uh, larval misting, uh, thermal fogging and all that, like what I said, the number one solution to addressing mosquito is source reduction. If you, like what I said, if you have a body of water that's producing the adult, week in, week out. You will go and miss a doubt. You go and thermal fog. 
you're only killing the generation after generation. But if you take away that body of water, remove it, then downstream, there's no misting, no thermal fogging, we don't need any of that. So the number one solution to reducing mosquito is to get rid of the breeding habitat, especially when it comes to dengue. Okay, they are container breeders. So you get rid of the container, yes, but then drains, no, nobody can get rid of drain. That's where you come in with your misting, larvae siding, and what have you. So always remember, go for the most effective, which is source reduction. Okay, we have time for another two more questions. If anybody still has got any queries. Yes, sir. Uh, Brian? Hi, I'm Amika from Singapore American School. So my question is with regards to, uh, in Singapore, we know that the June, July, these are the typical hot climates in the country. And uh, for you mentioned that one of the solutions is BTI. But to my understanding that BTI is actually uh, susceptible to degradation, to sunlight. So I'm just wondering what is the frequency uh, uh, recommended for BTI since the degradation effect is about 24 hours after the uh, after the installation process of the BTI. So I'm just wondering what's the frequency like for the BTI uh, procedure. Yeah, thank you. Well, you got it spot on. BTI, like I said, is bacillus. It's a bacteria. It's a living organism. So in order for efficacy of BTI, again, it must be dispensed at the correct time. If it's a body of water, you put it there uh, earlier on, say about 6.30, 7, yes, the effectiveness is there. As it gets hotter and hotter, some of the bacteria will die. Yes. How, how often do you need to do this? In order to break a transmission scale, from the egg to the adult, it takes about seven days. So the frequency of any vector control or mosquito control operation, to be exact, should be done in a seven-day cycle to break this chain. Okay, so you break the chain. So anything more than that, yes, you may get the adults escaping. So coming back to BTI, yes, heat is one thing. Then the other thing that you must also take note is, are there any other chemicals in that body of water? For example, if you want to control BTI, uh, you control Culex using BTI, it may not be effective in organically polluted water. The pollutants in the water may kill the bacteria. It also depends on how you store the uh, bacteria. You go and put it in a hot room and all that, the bacteria may die. Okay, and how long you keep it, shelf life and all that, yeah, because it's a living organism. So yes, the June, July are the hotter months. Uh, if you ask me, you should not be uh, doing work in June, July. June, July, you do work means you're firefighting, uh, which is what NEA is doing now. They are firefighting. When do you plan for your dengue? It's in January, February. Preparation for war starts during peacetime. You don't roll out a contract in June, July. You roll out an enhanced contract somewhere in February, March to tackle your June, July. That is another mistake most people have done. The moment dengue is up, then say, okay, okay, I need extra men now. Uh, I need this, I need this. Uh, you're going into firefighting mode. We advocate that any preparation, any new contract you want to roll out, don't roll out in June, July. It must be in January for the financial year, April, where most of you will also follow the government system. So it must be there so that come June, July, your PCO or whoever is familiar with the terrain, familiar with the uniqueness of your premises and what have you. So they will be armed for June, July. So June, July doesn't mean you start work somewhere in, in the month of June, July. It has to 
your, your work, your preparation, your planning way ahead. Way ahead. Which is something I have been advocating uh, for a very, very long time. Because uh, preparation for war starts during peacetime. So understanding a product is very important. BTI, what is it? How it degrades? How effective it is? How long it can be in a body of water? All those are very essential knowledge to understand how they work. Because whichever product you must maximize the efficacy of the product by knowing. Not only that, you must also use the correct equipment to dispense them. Okay, equipments are just as important. Because remember, I, I, I saw uh, somebody was mentioning uh, the company only uses the steel machine. Uh, that is the steel machine. Uh, that's the, the only machine that's got two horsepower. The rest of the BTI mixers are all one horsepower. I'm not selling the brand, <laughs> but I'm saying the product is only as good as the equipments, the application rate, applicator as well. All these play a part. No use buying the most expensive chemical or biocide when you don't know how to use. Okay, another question. One last one. If there's nothing, there were, there were some questions uh, where some of you have actually posted to the company. What we will do is, because of the time constraint, we will write, write back uh, officially to to those who have raised those questions. Uh. Okay. Anything else? Uh? Uh, Mr. Gavin, you have anything to... Yeah. Okay, with that, we have come to the end of our seminar. And I'd like to take this opportunity once again to thank all of you for the time that you have taken okay, to be present here with us. And uh, we sincerely hope and we know that you will be taking back a lot of knowledge from this seminar. We have got some feedback and we will be working on that. And uh, yeah, so we'll be in touch as well. Okay, uh, with that, once again, on behalf of the management and staff of Verminator, as well as uh, Mr. Rama, who's our guest speaker, we would like to thank all of you for making this possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>